Well, good morning, Spring Lake Village. Uh, it's the month of June already. So as I mentioned uh, last week, um, I did hope to um, hold this month's lectures in person, but uh, Liz and I decided that there was just too many logistical problems um, holding two lectures back to back uh, this month. But it looks like next month I will be back once again to deliver a new lecture series in person this time. So this month's lecture is entitled uh, Cancel Culture in Antiquity, the Mysterious Death of Hypatia of Alexandria. How did I come up with this lecture series? Well, all of us have witnessed this last year, the uh, social upheaval in our great cities and um, this rise of cancel culture and identity politics. And it's something that took place um, not in the not too distant past during uh, Mao's cultural revolution. And then two centuries before the French Revolution um, is an example of uh, cancel culture. But it actually existed many centuries earlier in the great city of uh, Alexandria, which was the intellectual and cultural hub of the ancient world. So I thought, let's go back several centuries and um, see what took place and how we can draw parallels with what's taking place in our own time. So this week's lecture is entitled Alexandria in the first century AD, a troubling time for pagan apologetics. So ancient Alexandria, as we've discussed in uh, previous lectures, was the greatest intellectual and scientific hub of the ancient world. It was founded, of course, by Alexander the Great, the first of many Greek city-states that he would established in the lands he conquered in the Near and Middle East. And it was established in 331 BC um, in a port uh, just west of the Nile Delta. And it would eventually become a great intellectual hub under the reign of the Ptolemies. So, Ptolemy I had been a general under Alexander the Great. Uh, he went to establish Alexandria as the capital of his new dynasty. And it was there that the body of Alexander the Great was brought for burial, a great propaganda coup on his part. The city under the patronage of the Ta Ptolemies would become the wealthiest city of the ancient world, the largest city of the ancient world, boasting upwards of a million people. And again, the epicenter of Hellenistic uh, culture. It became a university town that attracted the great scientists, intellectuals, and philosophers of the day. People like Aristosthenes, who was uh, successful in determining the circumference of the earth in the third century within uh, 50 miles. It was also the place where Euclid, the great mathematician, would teach geometry and where Archimedes, the great astronomer, would also come and teach. Alexandria too was um, the site of one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, uh, the famous lighthouse or Pharos of Alexandria, but what, it was mostly famous for its great um, educational institution known as the Museum, from which we get the word museum. And the Museum was a kind of research institute um, that housed the great library, the uh, great archive that would eventually store somewhere like 300,000 to 400,000 scrolls and books um, 
that uh, dealt with uh, astronomy, philosophy, architecture, art, uh, hermeneutics. Um, it's, it housed uh, the writings of Aristotle and uh, Plato, the great Hellenistic thinkers, but it also uh, collected ancient uh, treatises from all parts of the ancient world were housed here. Uh, the Ptolemies would require uh, merchants to reveal everything they had uh, aboard their ships. And if they had any books, they had to produce them. And if these books um, were not part of the uh, library at Alexandria, they could be copied and in some instances even uh, confiscated. So Alexandria was considered the greatest intellectual hub of the ancient uh, world. We're um, told that the library was partially destroyed at the time uh, Julius Caesar visited uh, Alexandria in order to adjudicate um, between Cleopatra VII, with whom he had an affair and produced a child, Caesarian and her younger brother. And a civil war broke out between the two factions. And um, according to ancient sources like Plutarch, the library um, went up in flames, but later sources claim it still existed. In any case, it was um, a loss to the ancient world, the fact that thousands of man manuscripts uh, went up in flames during um, this civil war that broke out in 48 BC. So the city of Alexandria then um, was also the uh, site, was a city that saw a lot of social and political upheaval over the course of many centuries. Rioting uh, broke out frequently between competing factions um, because this was a great multicultural city from the uh, very start. Uh, it was a city that consisted of indigenous Egyptians, Jews who already had arrived and settled in Alexandria in the third century BC, and many hundreds more would arrive after the destruction of Jerusalem in uh, AD 70. These were the Jews of the diaspora at the time. And uh, there were also um, Greeks who had arrived uh, when Alexandria was established, um, first by Alexander and then under the uh, Ptolemies of Egypt who ruled for roughly uh, 300 years. So uh, from about uh, 305 AD until the annexation of Egypt in 30 BC. There were Nubians, there were uh, Syrians, and as I mentioned, the indigenous Egyptians of, of uh, the region all of them lived together, a city um, at its height of 750,000 to as many as 1 million. The Jewish uh, population was quite sizable, maybe 25 to 30,000. Now, what made it a city also of great diversity was the fact that many um, religions were practiced. So you had uh, the centuries old Pharaonic religions. So these were the state religions of ancient Egypt that had gone that went back many, many centuries. So the worship of Zeus Amun, the worship of Horus, the worship of the god Apis, the worship of the god of the underworld, uh, Osiris. These were the state sanctioned religions of the pharaohs of Egypt still practiced at the arrival of the Greeks who would introduce their pantheon of Greek gods. So the worship of Zeus, the worship of Aphrodite, the worship of Athena, the worship of Demeter, 
and uh, many other uh, Greek deities as well. And there were also um, foreign religions that were introduced from the uh, Near East. Uh, so Astarte, Sibylle, etc. So you had this interesting brew mixture of many religions and what we find uh, with the arrival of the Greeks is the amalgamation or syncretism of various religions. So the Greeks, uh, Macedonian Greeks under the Ptolemies would inaugurate a new state religion that could be practiced by all. And that was the cult of Serapis who was kind of identified with Egyptian sun gods, but also with Greek deities like Apollo. So he was an interesting mixture of both Greek and Egyptian gods. And that would become the, a very popular religion that could be pro practiced by all the disparate ethnic groups. Perhaps the most uh, popular religion, however, was that of the goddess um, Isis um, and her son Osiris. And Isis would later be identified within the Christian community that arrived in the first century with the Virgin Mary. And her son Osiris would be identified with uh, Jesus Christ. Now I mentioned um, the uh, large Jewish population that was autonomous. It had its own ethnarch. It had its own neighborhood, a very sizable neighborhood or quarter. There were uh, five quarters um, in Alexandria. This was a beautiful Greek polis that had been divided on orthogonal lines, uh, filled with Hellenistic buildings, uh, civic centers, auditorium, theaters, hippodrome, law courts, baths, etc. So this glistening, the most beautiful, most resplendent of all the Greek cities of the ancient world, the Jews um, would practice their ancient religion, uh, be given special legal rights to be an autonomous people, they had their own synagogues, they had their own rulers, ethnarchs, but they, as we've discussed in earlier lectures, were enamored by Hellenistic culture, the literature, the philosopher, the ideology would merge with uh, Jewish thought. So although many Jews practiced their faith, their Judaism, many of them were very um, Hellenistic, in their worldview, very, very uh, cosmopolitan. Um, remember, it was the Jews of Alexandria that would translate the Old Testament um, according to tradition. Uh, 70 scholiasts, 70 transcribers would translate the Hebrew scriptures um, into Koine Greek called the uh, Septuagint. Um, Philo of Alexandria is a perfect example, great uh, thinker of the first century, um, is a great example of a Hellenistic uh, Jew uh, living during the great heyday of Alexandria. So what I'm trying to show you is a, an environment of a mixture of various races, of various creeds, of diversity of religions that eventually would clash with one another, and oftentimes in very violent ways, as you will uh, soon see. So during um, the lifetime of Philo of Alexandria, he was an eyewitness to uh, pogroms. Um, against the Jews. So there were riots that erupted on the streets of Alexandria already um, in the first century AD. And we know the uh, Greeks were angered, the Hellenistic Greeks um, were enraged 
with the Jewish population. They thought they had too many rights and uh, the fact that they still had their um, own king um, enraged them. Uh, the Judean king Agrippa I had visited uh, Alexandria shortly before 38 AD and uh, the uh, local Greek population spat upon him, mocked him, and um, asked the Jews, why is it that you have a king? We no longer have a pharaoh or king. The Romans had annexed Egypt in 30 BC, and that put an end to the rule of the Ptolemaic uh, kings. So there was this animus towards the Jewish uh, population um, at that time. And it didn't help that the Roman governor or prefect um, depicted here, uh, an image, supposedly an image of the prefect Aulus Vilius Flaccus. Now, if you look at him, he is Roman, but it's clear that um, some kind of a uh, racial mi mixing has taken place. Um, you can see he has sort of maybe Syrian, uh, Egyptian, maybe even Jewish blood in him. Nonetheless, um, he supported the Hellenistic rioters who um, had attacked the Jews in uh, 38 AD. Um, again, the Hellenists had questioned even the loyalty of the Jews as citizens of uh, Alexandria. There was uh, more violence that took place against the Jewish population um, about the time that an embassy was sent to uh, Rome to see Nero. Uh, and at that time, Jews who were part of the deliberation, part of this embassy, congregated in the great amphitheater at Alexandria, and they were viciously attacked by a Greek mob who uh, overwhelmed uh, the Jews sitting in the theater. Many of them were killed. Um, those who survived were burnt to death. Uh, so, Again, this is an early example of a pogrom in this uh, turbulent city of political and religious strife. And um, afterwards, uh, and again, 115 AD, after a civil war, we find actually a number of Jews actually uh, leaving Alexandria and, re and relocating either to Rome, which had a very sizable Jewish population that would continue to grow, and, and uh, they would establish themselves in some of the other uh, cities of uh, North Africa. So you have many um, centers of Jewish life, uh, the Ladino Jews of uh, North Africa at this time. So, more political strife, more religious uh, strife between the various ethnic groupings, religious groupings would uh, grow with the arrival of uh, Christianity. Now, many of the Christians who arrived in the first century and um, the evangelist Saint Mark, um, one of the gospel uh, writers, uh, long associated with the introduction of Christianity to Egypt, we're told by uh, the Jewish historian Josephus, he arrived in uh, 43, AD, 43 AD, where he began to proselytize many of the residents of Alexandria and then uh, made his way around Egypt. He left and would come back uh, 20 years later. And this was the establishment of Christianity in Egypt. Uh, Egyptian Christians are called Copts. Um, comes from the Arabic uh, upti, but uh, even earlier, 
etymology connected with the Greek word for Egypt, Egyptos, corrupted to Copt. So Christian Egyptians um, were known as the Copts, who still exist today in Egypt and uh, the Sudan. Now, many of the uh, Christians in Alexandria were recent converts. Um, these were Jews who had emigrated from Jerusalem, many more after the destruction in AD 70. And as you know, of course, um, earliest uh, Christians were Jews, and uh, many of them who had uh, established themselves in Alexandria already had embraced um, Christianity. St. Mark uh, becomes the first bishop of Alexandria, and Alexandria becomes one of the most important centers of Christianity and early monasticism, as well as one of the five patriarchates. There's still, even today, a patriarch of Alexandria of the Eastern Orthodox slash Coptic branch of Christianity. But the other patriarchs, the earliest one, Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, and um, after Constantinople is established as the great capital of Eastern Orthodoxy, it becomes in the fourth century a patriarchate uh, as well. So the Christians um, now were in a great struggle too. The same had happened with the Jews when they arrived of this monotheistic faith of Judaism having to deal with the polytheism of the Hellenists, of the Greek uh, religion, the pantheism, the polytheism of the uh, Hellenistic Greeks, and the ancient polytheistic Egyptian rituals, the Christians too um, now would have to struggle in uh, introducing Christianity um, against the power of these established polytheistic uh, faiths. Christianity, too, would have to endure waves of uh, persecution um, throughout the empire, beginning with the Neronian persecutions uh, in 64, especially after the Great Fire in Rome. Nero um, accused the Christians of setting fire, and this unleashed persecution against Christians, not only in the city of Rome, but throughout the empire and in Alexandria. Many um, Egyptian cops were uh, attacked, brutalized um, during this first great uh, persecution. Mark himself. Uh, would become a martyr of the Christian faith when he returned to Alexandria around 68 AD. We have the account uh, of how he was attacked, brutalized, dragged through uh, the streets of Alexandria until he was uh, dead. Uh, nonetheless, the Christian faith thrived uh, in Egypt, eventually Hellenistic philosophy uh, and metaphysics would, f would merge, fuse together syncret through syncretism uh, with the Christian faith. A school of Christian catechism was established in Alexandria around 170, the famous Didascalia, which you see at the right, uh, you see an image of uh, or icon of St. Mark in the upper left-hand corner. The Vidascalia became one of the great um, Christian uh, schools that um, trained uh, deacons uh, and catechumens um, at the time.
So we have the persecutions under Nero, more persecutions um, in the first century. But then um, we find also um, the Hellenists um, who still clung tight to their time-honored uh, Greek Hellenistic ritual practices, even though a lot of, we, as I mentioned, we see a synthesis of Egyptian and Hellenistic um, rituals being merged together, they uh, were persecuting uh, Christians in Egypt in the second century and especially in the third century. But the greatest uh, wave of persecution would take place um, under the authorities of the Romans, especially during the reigns of the Roman Emperor Decius around 250. And the greatest persecution of all, the last great persecution during the reign of the Emperor Diocletian, beginning in around 302. And uh, we see under Diocletian um, already persecution about 16 years earlier in 284, in which hundreds of cops were murdered. Um, and so many were killed uh, in the Coptic church. The date in 284, or 284, the year is considered the beginning of the calendar for Coptics, the calendar of the martyrs. The persecutions would come to an end when Constantine assumed authority as the emperor of the new Roman East and the establishment of Christianity as an official legalized religion by his issuance of the Edict of Milan in 312 and 313 gave Christianity now for the first time legal status. But despite the fact that Christianity now would emerge as the preeminent faith, we not only find um, riots ensuing between Christians and pagans and Jews still living in this great cosmopolitan city of Alexandria, but even within the Christian faith, um, violence ensuing because you had two competing factions that emerged and it had to do with the nature of Jesus Christ. So on the one hand, you had the uh, so-called Arians who espoused Arianism named after um, an Alexandria, Alexandrian cleric by the name of Arius, born around 256, who said that the Son of God, or Jesus Christ, was not co-eternal with God the Father. In other words, Jesus and God the Father did not coexist from time immemorial. They were, in fact, two separate beings. And Arianism speaks of dualism. So God the Father and God the Son as two separate entities, not co-eternal. Now, this was heresy and went against the established traditional orthodoxy of Trinitarianism, the triune nature of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as co-eternal, co-equal, existing forever at the same time. And this was enshrined at the first ecumenical council in the Anatolian city of Nicaea that had been convened by Constantine, in which this issue was finally adjudicated by the clerics who attended this first ecumenical council and enshrined in the famous Nicene Creed, okay? And the Greek word of one essence, 
homoousia, meaning that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are of one singular essence. So today, of course, we kind of scratch our heads and wonder how could bloodshed ensue between these competing factions, but it did. And this is the climate that existed. You kind of have a kind of cancel culture in which one Christian faction at one particular period in which you'd have an Arian bishop would attack and persecute the Nicene uh, Christians and vice versa. When a Nicene bishop held, uh, held reign and uh, had been elevated by the emperor, and then they would viciously, viciously attack the Arians. Again, it's hard to understand how this happened, but it did. So one group canceling out, trying to erase, eradicate uh, the other. Now, this, um, this, so we have within uh, the Christian community, this uh, violent factionalism, but um, we also then will see Christian full out um, attack on the, uh, the, the persistence of Hellenistic religion and ideas in which Christians now will viciously go after the last remnants of pa paganism in the ancient world. And this would um, increase and grow in earnest when the Christian emperor Theodosius in 391 uh, made Christianity the official state religion of the empire. It enjoyed supreme legal status at the expense of the still existing pagan rituals. The Greco-Roman uh, rituals were still being practiced. And uh, this marks the beginning of an attempt to really try to wipe out through a kind of cancel culture which involved desecration, destruction of the great shrines of the Greco-Roman world. Like for example, the uh, great sanctuary at Delphi, which had existed now really for nine centuries, the great oracle of Apollo at Delphi. It could not be stamped out despite um, earlier attempts, but Theodosius ordered the closure of shrines like that at Delphi, the Olympic Games uh, in the Peloponnese, but we discover that it was not easy to eradicate and wipe out these long-held pagan. Now, by pagan, that is not the best word. What we mean by pagan is uh, those um, non-Jewish, non-Christian Hellenistic rituals that were still very much in place at the time that Christianity reigned uh, supreme. So now we will see uh, with the uh, legitimacy and the ascendancy of Christianity as the one official Roman state religion, an all-out attack on the part of the Christian faith to try to wipe out um, the last remnants of paganism. So we see this taking place um, now. And this, I, we're coming up now into the fourth century and the fifth century at the time of Hypatia of Alexandria, who will be the discussion. She is sort of the um, iconic figure, sort of the last symbol of this, of Hellenistic ideas, of Hellenistic intellectualism and philosophy. She pretty much singularly summed up the last gasp of Hellenism in this new Christian uh, polity. Uh, but now we see the destruction of 
paganism by uh, vandalism of many uh, Greco-Roman statuary. Now that sounds very familiar. What do we? What have we seen this last year? But desecration, destruction of statues once venerated, but now considered um, symbols of racism or this kind of cancel culture tries a kind of demnatio memoriae in which you erase symbols of the past and um, assert um, a new world view through uh, identity politics and cultural identity now. You know, this is what we're seeing happening now in real time very quickly, but it's something that existed 16 centuries ago in ancient Alexandria. So um, Alexandrian Christians who had begun in the early part of the fourth century with the Diocletian uh, persecutions where the persecuted um, ethnic people, these were the people who were brutally um, attacked by the Hellenists, but move forward 80 years, 90 years, now uh, Christianity enjoys supremacy, legal, uh, the, the greatest legal status now, it in turn will uh, viciously attack uh, and marginalize uh, paganism. So uh, we now see wholesale attack on shrines, um, some of the greatest shrines associated with Hellenistic practices. Um, the the Mithraeum of the great Mithraeum of Alexandria. Mithras was another competing religion. Uh, the famous priest Mithras. It was a competing religion, a, a threat to Christianity at times. Very popular among merchants and uh, soldiers within the Roman Empire. We find the Arian patriarch George uh, desecrating the famous uh, Mithraeum in. Uh, Alexandria and 361 uh, monks, Christian monks were encouraged to um, arouse uh, their Christian laity to riot and destroy a pagan statuary, tear them down, desecrate them and um, burn uh, famous shrines of, of the of the Hellenists, um, again, still uh, widely popular within uh, Alexandria. But the greatest destruction would take place in 391. And this is sometimes seen as by historians of late antiquity as really the singular end of, if you will, Christianity's moment in which. Um, it will triumph over pagan Hellenism. But that's not really true, as we'll see, because um, despite attempts to put an end um, to pagan practices, um, it will persist. But the destruction of the single greatest Hellenistic temple dedicated to that um, new Hellenistic god, Serapis, widely popular uh, not only among the Hellenists but the Egyptians, that was destroyed. Uh, the uh, Patriarch Theophilus in 391 ordered the closure of pagan shrines in Alexandria and uh, the most celebrated was the one you see here, the Serapium. He um, encouraged uh, Christian writers to go in destroy and desecrate. This had also housed, um, we're told, some of the books that may have been retrieved from the library. It may have been another um, sort of other repository, part of the large library of Alexandria, wherein many great manuscripts were stored. And so we see um, cancel culture run amok here, if you will. This term cancel culture, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to define, but think of one, uh, a new group 
that now is reigning supreme, trying to wipe out, destroy, cancel, if you will, um, the older established owner and its emblemata, its symbols, whether they be uh, statues or books, canceling out people by deplatforming de them, whatever. So this lecture is an attempt to try to say that what's going on today, although we're unnerved, um, we, we're, we're shocked by what's taking place in real time and so quickly actually existed 16, 17, 18 centuries ago in this uh, great multicultural city, a city of great intellects and scholars, a place where some of the greatest scientific minds had congregated, and yet we see this political, social, and religious strife um, percolate, percolating and constantly um, erupting. It, it, these horrible riots would erupt. Uh, so in comparison of what's going on today, what took place in Alexandria in many ways was far more violent, far more brutal, far more deadly than what's taking on, what's taking place today. Although, unfortunately, we do see sadly um, lives being lost um, on our great cities. In any case, uh, again, what I was trying to do is set the tone and uh, provide you the uh, social and political backdrop, the unrest that was taking place at the time of this great champion of paganism, the woman that we'll be examining uh, next week and in uh, the third week. Remember, um, on the 18th, I am not going to be holding a lecture. I have a family event that had already uh, been scheduled. So um, we'll meet next week and then again on the 25th to discuss um, the life of uh, Hypatia and how she became a martyr amidst uh, this cancel culture, this attempt by um, Christian zealots to eradicate the last remnants of paganism in uh, the great intellectual capital of the ancient world, uh, Alexandria. So thank you for joining me again. I am sorry this is a virtual lecture again, but I really hope we do meet in July. I don't want to promise, but it looks very good that um, I will be with you once again in the flesh um, the first Friday in July. So um, take care until we uh, meet again uh, next Friday.